For the grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people, and we are instructed to turn from godless living and sinful pleasures. We should live in this evil world with wisdom, righteousness, and devotion to God. I will be reading from Psalm 10, verses 1 to 6, and then concluding with verse 14. Why, Lord, do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? In his arrogance, the wicked man hunts down the weak, who are caught in the schemes he devises. He boasts about the cravings of his heart. He blesses the greedy and reviles the Lord. In his pride, the wicked man does not seek him. In all his thoughts, there is no room for God. His ways are always prosperous. Your laws are rejected by him. He sneers at all his enemies. He says to himself, nothing will ever shake me. He swears, no one will ever do me harm. Verse 14. But you, God, see the trouble of the afflicted. You consider their grief and take it in hand. The victims commit themselves to you. You are the helper of the fatherless. Now I'll be reading from Matthew 13 to 18. When they had gone, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I call my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and in its vicinity who were two years old and younger, in accordance with the time that he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and refusing to be comforted, because they are no more. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Two tents, two paradigms. I don't like it very much when someone uses a big fancy word and I don't know what it means. There, I, 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 but I do like it when I find out about how, what a word means and see how well it fits and, and how it, it's, it, it works in a situation and I understand it and just see how it completely fits. That, that it's one of those words. I, I remember uh, growing up hearing um, Ellie Maxwell talk about the word circumspectly in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 15. And the word circumspectly is one of those words we never use, but as you think about it and you understand what it means, it's talking about how to live the Christian life in a way it's uh, in, in uh, thinking about everything that we do and, and, and not just flying by the seat of our pants, but that we're really um, thinking about our life and, and our relationship with God and it's really on purpose. And he used to use this, this word picture of uh, a cat walking along the top of a a, a um, wall that has glass sticking up on it, and how that cat would negotiate those sharp um, edges as he walked along the top. Every step would mean something. He would have to be very deliberate about every step. And that's a word picture that I'll never forget about the word circumspectly. Today, we're going to be looking at a word paradigm. And I don't know about you, but paradigm is a word I don't use very often. Uh, But when I think about what the word means, it applies very, very well to what we're going to be looking at today. The word paradigm in the dictionary means a framework containing the basic assumptions, ways of thinking, and methodology that are commonly accepted by a discipline or group. And it probably still doesn't make sense. So, here's my way of trying to describe what a paradigm is. A paradigm is a a set of lenses that you look at life through. Preconceived ideas or assumptions that you make or values that you have, things that make you look through at life a different way. Now, if you're raised in the church 
and you know your Bible, you probably have a Judeo-Christian paradigm, which means that the Bible informs how you look at life, how you make decisions, about your values, what you know as right and wrong. All those things are informed by the Bible, and that's your lenses that you looked at. That's a paradigm. Now, paradigms are things that we can have in other areas of our life, whether it came from the education that we had, whether it's the family of origin that we had, maybe the age group that we're in, all affects those ways we look at life. And sometimes paradigms are neither here nor there uh, as to whether they're good or bad, but sometimes they are. And so today I would like us to look at some paradigms that are in the Bible. You might not have thought of them as a paradigm, but they're a way that we approach our relationship with God. A kind of lenses that we might look at God through, and it affects the way that we, we relate to him. The topic is really especially close to me, because as I was exposed, first of all, to this concept and th- this portion of scripture, it deeply affected me. First of all, to realize that my paradigm wasn't one that I wanted to be in. I wanted it to change. I wanted to grow. I wanted to be closer to God than I had been. And my paradigm was affecting that. And I wanted it, I wanted change. I wanted more. I wanted closer intimacy with God. And it had to start with this change of my paradigm, the way I thought about God. So I'd like us to turn to Exodus chapter 33. In Exodus 33, we have a few short verses, just five verses, that describe for us something that I had never seen before until just a few years ago. Uh, It describes for us a place where Moses and Joshua would meet with God. And so it starts in verse 7, and this is the only place in the Bible where this is described. But this is Exodus chapter 33, starting in verse 7. Now Moses used to take a tent and pitch it outside the camp some distance away, calling it the tent of meeting. Anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp. And whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people rose and stood at the entrance of their tents, watching Moses until he entered the tent. As Moses went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. Whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, they all stood and worshiped, each at the entrance of his own tent. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks with his friend. Then Moses would return to the camp But his young aide, Joshua, son of Nun, would not leave the tent. The word of the Lord. The reason why I think I hadn't seen this before is because the term tent of meeting is used for two different tents. And that's why it's confusing a bit. You see, this is the only place where this particular tent is mentioned. It's called the tent of meeting. But if you grew up in the church and you heard stories about the tabernacle, the formal place of worship that was established in the center of the Israeli camp, it was also called the tent of meeting. And so that's why it's confusing. Now, I'm going to, uh, as I was doing a bit of research about this, um, part of it is that There's uh, disagreements as to how these two sets worked with each other. So first of all, so that we keep things clear, I'm going to call the tent on the outside of the the camp the tent of meeting, and I'm going to call the one on the inside of the center of the Jewish camp, I'm going to call it tabernacle, okay? Because that's the one, if you were raised in the church and you know the King James Version, that's what it would have called that tent, okay? Okay. So, we're, so that's how we'll keep them separate as I discuss them. The issue that we, we face is that there's disagreement as to how these two related to each other. All right? 
The tent of meeting, uh, for some said that it was first of all, and after the tabernacle was created, that the tent of meeting became obsolete. They didn't use it anymore because now they had the tabernacle. It was first, and then the tabernacle was later. But that's just an assumption because we don't have any record of the one on the outside of the the tent of meeting ever being torn down or ever not being used anymore. But there is a little bit of evidence that shows that actually the two of them remained working together at the same time. The reason why is because uh, the, the tent in the middle of the camp was only accessible by the priests and Levites. Now Moses was a Levite. He could go in to the tabernacle. But Joshua couldn't. He was from the tribe of Ephraim. And so he wouldn't have access to the tabernacle. But we're told later on that Joshua would meet with God and he would hear from God and the cloud would come. And so really the only explanation for that is that that tent on the outside, the tent of meeting was still up and running. So if you could imagine, there are these two tents happening simultaneously. One of them is in the inside of the cabin, of the tent, I mean inside of the, 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 all the, the people in their, in their camp, and it's in the middle of the camp of all the tribes of people uh, around it, and on the outside of the camp is this tent of meeting, and they're happening at the same time. So let me just give you a little bit of an overview of a compare and contrast of the two. The tent, uh, the tabernacle, required a whole system of sacrifices and offerings and rituals and rules. But the tent of meeting was informal and was relaxed. You see, if you ever read through your Bible, and you've had the opportunity to be able to, to, to read all the, the regulations that were associated with the tabernacle worship, it goes on and on and on. Chapters and chapters of all the, the restrictions and the rules that went along with tabernacle worship. This is all that was written about the tent of meeting that if a person um, sincerely wanted to hear from God, they could go to the tent and hear from God. That's all that was, all that was there. Here's another uh, uh, comparison. The tabernacle was ex- accessed only by priests and Levites, as I mentioned, but the tent of meeting was open to anyone who wanted to use it. Look here at verse 7. It says, um, anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp. Anyone. And of the 12 tribes of Israel, the Jewish people, only the, those in the tribe of Levi, and of those, only Aaron's family, were the, who were priests, could have access to the tabernacle. Though the invitation was given for anyone to come to the camp of Israel to come and come to the the tent of meeting, we don't have any record that anyone else ever did except for Moses and Joshua. Another comparison. The pillar of cloud that symbolized God's presence would hover, hover over both tents. It's not like one was superior or the uh, over the other, but they were both places where God would meet with people. Verse 11, it says, uh, sorry, that the Lord would speak with Moses face to face as a man would speak with a friend. That's the kind of way that Moses would be able to speak with God in that tent. And the fourth comparison is that the tabernacle seemed to invoke fear and distance, whereas the tent of meeting was safe and up close. This face-to-face kind of meeting that he had. Joshua 
so liked to be able to meet with God there that when Moses would leave, Moses was obviously a more task orientated, uh, you know, get her done. And so he goes in there, meets with God, finds out what he needs to do and leaves. Joshua just likes to be there and be with God. And he could because that's the kind of place that the tent of meeting was. So if you had asked the people in that time, I mean, what, what, what you see is happening here is that the people of Israel chose, they had a choice then between going to the tent of meeting and going to the tabernacle, and obviously they chose tabernacle, except for Moses and Joshua, but they chose tabernacle. And so if you would have talked to the people at that time and, said to, and asked them, do you have connection with God? They would have said, yes, I do. I go to the tabernacle. But you can already see the kind of connection difference that there would be between those who would go to the tent of meeting or those who would go to the tabernacle. So even in the Old Testament, God had given his people option of either intimacy or distance in relationship with him. That's what the choice was made to them, and they could come either way they wanted to, but that was the way God had brought that, given that to them. So God, the, why, so you're asking, so why are we talking about this today? And the reason why is I believe that same choice is available to us today. That we have a choice in our relationship with God, either to come to him like the people would come to the tabernacle or we can come to him like people who come to the tent of meeting. And that's our choice. So if you think about how God, um, how God would uh, open the the place for people to come and worship. What was happening there at that time? Well, if you think about in in our time, um, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself and I'm getting a little bit, you can pray for me, I'm getting a little bit out of of sorts here. Um, Think about it this way. Um, God, I really am. I'm really having a difficult time. You gonna come up and pray for me, hon? Yeah. Holy Spirit, we need you. And this morning, Thomas confessed that he needs your strength and your power. These are really important words. You have invited us into intimacy with you, Father. And we know the enemy does not wish for us to have an intimate relationship with you. And so I just stand against all the interruptions that the enemy is throwing at uh, Pastor Tom this morning. I stand against you in the name of Jesus. And I anoint Tom with the power of the Holy Spirit to say all that you have laid, Father, all that you have laid on his heart all week. I pray for liberty and I pray for confidence and the ability to clearly articulate all and only that which you want us to hear this morning. I pray this in the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Thanks. We still have that choice. And the way that that choice looks like today is that some of us still impose on our connection with God rituals and rules to somehow appease God in our connection with him. We still do that. Even though we don't have to, we do. We try to earn a a, a connection with God. And I'm not talking about unsaved people who are trying to earn their salvation. I'm talking about Christians who already have accepted Christ as their savior, who already have a relationship with God, but somehow they have this feeling that they have to earn the right to have access with God. In my life, it was, I had to make sure that I had my devotions in the morning and my tithe was up to date, or I felt I didn't have the right to talk to God. That's tabernacle worship. 
That feeling that you have to do something to earn the connection that Jesus Christ already bought for us. And there's also comes with it this feeling of apprehension and aversion to connecting with God. I know that we're supposed to have a fear of God, which is a holy respect for him and his holiness, but not be afraid of him. We don't need to be afraid of God, and so we don't have to come with this aversion. Think about it this way. When you sin, and I'm sure each of us have to confess that there are times when we do, when you sin, do you run to God or do you run away from him? Because a good relationship, like I, I think about my, my wife and I, if there's any time when I've, I've, I've done something with my wife, after I get over that initial being defensive thing, I, I know I have to talk to her and I run to her and make it right. That's a good, healthy relationship. Do we do that with God? And if we don't, that's an indication to us that we have a tabernacle type of paradigm. We fear God. We're afraid of him. That the things that we have done will separate us and we we run the opposite direction. You see, when Jesus died, the veil inside the temple split from the top to the bottom, showing that it was God's initiative from the top to the bottom, and it made access to the Holy of Holies. Matthew chapter 27, verses 50 to 51. Jesus cried out again in a loud voice. He gave up his spirit, and at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom which is a pretty clear sign that God was taking the initiative that access to him was no longer through ritual. It was no longer through us having to do things to attain access to him. The paradigm, the tabernacle paradigm was now obsolete is what that was saying. So then why do we? Why do we create or, or maintain this paradigm of feeling as though we have to earn the right to access God. If you look at um, Exodus chapter 20, this is before Exodus 33, we have the story of the people at the, at the base of Mount Sinai. And this is, I believe, an answer to the question. It says in Exodus 20, verses 18 to 21, when the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain in smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed a distance and said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen, but do not have God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will keep you, uh, will be with you, to keep you from sinning. The people remained at a distance while, God, while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. If you remember that these are people who had been slaves and they were just getting to know God. And so when they saw the smoke and they saw all the things, they came to an assumption that God was unapproachable. Moses could So what was the difference between Moses approaching God and the people? Why could Moses do it and other people couldn't? I believe the people thought that they needed to have some kind of buffer between themselves and God. That they needed to have, because they they didn't understand God and didn't know him and what his character was like, and because there were unknowns, they felt they needed to have some kind of of a distance, some kind of safety, some kind of buffer that would, so they wouldn't, they wouldn't offend God in some way. And the reason why I bring that up is because I think that's the reason why many of us do the same thing. We create a, a, this, this um, tabernacle type of paradigm because we really don't know God and what he's like. 
We hear the stories. We hear the stories of, of, of smoke and fire and, and all these things. And, and so in our hearts, we come to a paradigm of distance, of creating safety between ourselves and God. But after Jesus died on the cross, God is inviting us to connect with him in a paradigm of a tent of meeting. It all comes down to trust. If you think about Joshua and of, of Moses, these are people who, had, who really knew God and trusted him. Joshua, he's the one who later on became one of the spies who gave the good report. He was one who was able to say, God can help us take down the giants of Canaan. He had a trust in God so that he wasn't afraid of God. Moses had a burning bush experience with God. He met with God and heard God speak. And so his, he didn't have a fear, afraid of God. But the people, they built a golden calf and they saw what happened when a person walks out of line with God. And so that became their paradigm of relating to God. But I believe that through what Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary, that we as New Testament believers don't need to approach God through a tabernacle paradigm. If you realize this morning that you've been functioning in that paradigm, that tabernacle paradigm, and that you would desire a closer intimacy with God, uh, uh, where, like Moses, you could, you could meet with God face to face. What do you do? Well, I can't, I mean, that would be a whole book. And I don't have time to, to, to do that this morning, this whole book. I might write a book someday, but not today. But this is one thing that I can tell you. This is how my journey with God of dismantling the tabernacle paradigm and embracing the tent of meeting paradigm what happened in my life. It didn't happen overnight, but it did happen through a desire, first of all, seeing the two and choosing tent over tabernacle. Saying, God, I want to be a person who, who, who can meet with you face to face. I want to give up all the the. the the paraphernalia, all the the struggles that there is in in a life that is a a tabernacle worship. I want rather intimacy with you. That's where it begins. And then this is the tough part, that the experience of that happened through tough times, where I got to know my God and what he's like through life experiences. When I couldn't stand, I felt I could I found out that God could hold me. When I couldn't pay the bills, I found out that God was my provider. When I was struck with loss and grief, I found out that God can fill that void in my life. That's where it begins. In a desire, first of all, to throw off the tabernacle and to embrace the tent of meeting and saying, God, I want something more. I want uh, an intimacy with you that, that I haven't had up to this point in my life. I'm going to call the worship team up at this time. And I just want to, in these quiet moments before they, they, they sing, just to give you the opportunity to, in your own heart, I mean, it's very easy as soon as we sing the song and we start talking to each other to leave the place and it's gone. We, we, it, we, we forgot about it. But in these quiet moments, where's your heart? Uh, I, I'm sure there are people who are here who already have a tent of meeting relationship with God. I know you do because I, I, I can sense it in you but I know there are also those of you 
who are functioning in the tabernacle. And there's more. There's a, a, a deeper intimacy that you can have with God if you're willing to throw off trying to, uh, on our own effort, achieve access to God. He's already bought it for us. We can meet him face to face. Ephesians 3.12. In him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. Hebrews 4.16. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. So let's just take just a couple seconds to, if you need to, to talk to God and ask him to show himself to you, that you want to get to know him in a deeper and more intimate way, and your desire to throw off the tent of meeting and to connect with God, or throw off the, tent, the tabernacle and meet with God. Let's just do that for a couple seconds here. Lord, you've heard people's hearts cry today. And this can be the new beginning for many to be able to be wanting more intimacy with you, wanting to not to be um, settling for less than what you have provided, but that people can really understand you to meet you as friend meets friend and to be able to know the intimacy there is of being in your presence. And so Lord, we pray that for each one here today, that we'll be able to go on this journey together of being able to be closer to you than we've been before, and to know the, your presence, and to be able to meet with you. In Jesus' name, amen. For God who said, let there be light in darkness, has made this light shine in our hearts so that we could know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. Amen.